A conversation about terrorism in America with a former commander of the Joint Terrorism Task Force right here in Arizona. Welcome to the Mike Broomhead Show. Well, I got a message. I got a song. Can I get a witness? Tell me what's going on. I show the people I've been away. All right, we're going to have a great interview. His name is Stephen Hooper. He is a professor of global security at Embry-Riddle University. But for years, he was with the FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Force right here in Arizona. Before we get to any of that, we start every show off with something we call The Sweep. It's sponsored by my good friends at Zero Res Carpet and Tile Cleaning. Now, let's start off. we got to start off every week with Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, the election. But there's so much to get to. Donald Trump in Ohio made a comment about re-implementing stop and frisk. And it made a lot of noise because that phrase is something that was deemed unconstitutional. It wasn't the idea of stopping suspicious people, interacting with them, making sure they weren't carrying anything they weren't supposed to. It was because the implementation of it was so racially biased. About a 90 percentile of mostly minority men um, Hispanic or African-American men. That's why it was deemed unconstitutional. So when Donald Trump talks about empowering law enforcement, I think we're all in favor of that, or most people are in favor of making sure law enforcement can do their jobs. But when you use the phrase stop and frisk, it made people think about that idea of it being racially motivated, which is what stopped people in their tracks. Let's look over at Hillary Clinton now. She, re she retains her lead over Trump with Hispanic voters, which really isn't a surprise, but she trails him nationally by five percentage points. So it's interesting how in a matter of a few weeks, she had a double-digit lead, and she now trails him nationally in the polls. A lot of it has to do with her not really disclosing everything about her illness in the minds of people and, of course, the email scandal. Let's dive into the bombings in New York and New Jersey. Ahmed Rahani, he is a 28-year-old. He was born in, um, in Afghanistan, but was brought as a young boy to America and is a citizen here in the United States. He was not on any terror watch list. Even if we look at this in hindsight, where he had spent some time, visited Pakistan over the last 10 years, in 2014 spent 11 months there, and what his friends were saying when he came home he is a different person. Um, they didn't use the word radicalized, but he was much more religious and talked about some anti-American sentiments. And during a family fight a couple of years ago, his father reported him as a terrorist. The investigation from the federal agencies didn't warrant further investigation. And now we know that he ended up, at what we've seen, the attacks he's been connected to in the Chelsea neighborhood of New York and in New Jersey. So it has now grown into a big investigation that thankfully no one was killed in those terrorist attacks. North Carolina, and well, let's talk about both places, North Carolina and Tulsa, Oklahoma. Starting in North Carolina, protests and riots continued. The governor declaring a state of, new, of, of emergency in that state. The issue here is the rioters. I don't understand it, what they're trying to accomplish. And to be honest, there's a difference between protesters and rioters. The rioters are just kind of glomming onto a cause. They're jumping onto something just to be destructive. But in the end, when you look at what's happening, the, the police have said the officer involved in the shooting was doing her or his job. Keith Scott is the man's name who was killed. His family said he had a book. He didn't have a book. The video showed he had a gun. Now, it's a shame that someone loses their life. I'm not wishing anyone dead, but to have these riots and looting because of this, when you turn out to be, it might be justified, is not the smart thing to do. And right here in Arizona, on Monday, it's scheduled in Tempe. They're calling it Moral Monday. The Reverend Jarrett Maupin wants to shut down the Mill Avenue Bridge. That's the bridge that goes across Tempe Town Lake into Mill Avenue down near ASU and ASU's campus. The fact is, I have had Jared Maupin on my show many times. We've gone to lunch. I know Jared Maupin. I just don't know what he's thinking. He is protesting the death of two people, one in Tempe and one in Phoenix. Neither of them have anything to do with going on in Tulsa, Oklahoma, not, not even close to what's happened in either location of Tulsa or in Charlotte, North Carolina. This seems so self-serving and out of character, really, as far as I'm concerned for Jared Maupin. And uh, finally, in the news headlines, transportation money. $41 million going to buy buses and light rail. It is, uh, 
not bus pullouts, by the way. The transportation tax in the city of Phoenix and where that money is going is really shocking. One of the things they're doing is expediting moving light rail because they're going to take a light rail line on Central from Jefferson, I believe, where it is, where it turns east and west, south, all the way down to baseline through South Phoenix. Now, there is a place where people will utilize light rail. I think that's a smart move, except the 40-something million dollars they're doing with that has nothing to do with building light rail. It's all going to the engineering. So imagine how expensive it's actually going to be to build. That, to me, is the biggest travesty of all of this. So when we look, in just a few moments, we've got a great interview coming up. Stephen Hooper is his name. He is a professor of global security at Embry-Riddle University, but he spent years as a commander with the Joint Terrorism Task Force right here in Arizona. Some great insight into terrorism, great insight into the investigation into ter terrorism. What happens when one of these attacks happen? How does this terrorism task force go in? We're going to do that interview here in just one moment, so don't go away. Before we get out of this, I want to talk to you about my friends at Zero Res. You've heard me talk about the empowered water. Zero Res uses a patented formula where they change the alkaline level of the water so they don't use soaps or chemicals in your carpet, which is better for the fabric in the carpet. They'll dry faster. They stay cleaner much longer. It's the best product on the market. You should never clean your carpets with soap anymore. That's the best way to do it. My friends at Zero Res will be back with the interview. Don't go away. All right, terrorism in America. Once again, America under attack. New York, New Jersey, we know about an attack in Minnesota. And what happens in the federal government with the agencies that the Joint Terrorism Task Force? So we have a former member of the task force right here in the Phoenix office. His name is Stephen Hooper. You're now a professor of global security at Embry-Riddle. Yes, at the College of Security and Intelligence. So my goal is always to talk to people smarter than me, <laughs> which is pretty easy to find. When you see these things happen based on your experience, you've got to think about it differently than the normal person does because you must be thinking about what the agency is doing. What happens when an attack happens with people like you in, in that position? Well, so understand when you talk about the attack first happening, first responders are the critical piece. And when the first responders show up, it's generally mayhem. And so they're trying to figure out if there's additional attacks going to happen and they've got to secure the area. By then, everybody knows about it. And I, uh, I always say in meetings with multiple agencies that are either part of the task force or are part of the first responders, I always say to them, guys, there's no he's in charge, he's in charge. We're all showing up. In today's world, when something bad happens that appears to be terrorism, we're all showing up. So the JTTF, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, who covers that AOR, that area of responsibility, that domain, they will get notified generally through, it could even be a news report. Hey, did you hear what's on the news? There was a bomb found and we'll immediately make contacts with our contacts at local and state law enforcement. If the indication is immediate that it's potentially terrorism, the JTTF will deploy a team. And it generally isn't just agents. It's local cops, it's state police, it's whoever's on the JTTF. Badges go in the desk drawers. They, they're Joint Terrorism Task Force officers, whether they're agents or local police. And they'll respond and they'll connect. In today's world, they, there's an established procedure under NIMS, the National Incident Management System, which was established post-2001. I know, it's true. <laughs> but the incident command will be set up for example, if you go back to uh, 2001 and the attack at the Pentagon, when that attack happened, for the first 10 days after that plane hit the Pentagon, the fire chief was the incident commander. The FBI and local police, Arlington PD, Virginia State Police, they were all answering to the fire chief for 10 days. Why? Because it was still a search and rescue mission. And okay. that's, that falls to the first responders and the emergency services. So in this case, the emergency services, the incident responders, would show up. They would be in charge as the FBI and Joint Terrorism Task Force, other federal agencies, like I said, in today's world, we're all showing up. When they get there, there's going to be someone established as the incident commander. It's automatic. And until there's a change, 
that person's designated in charge. In today's world, it's generally the local police chief, depending on the situation, like down in uh, uh, Charlotte right now with the madness going on right. down there. The chief said it last night, I am the incident commander. And that's based on that procedure that's in place. So that's the initial thing is there's an incident command established. There's generally a, a local agency fire or police chief that's designated in charge and in, until and unless it's determined to be something bigger than a local issue. Well, the coordination seemed to be so good because it, for within an hour and a half or so of the picture of the suspect being released by the FBI, by the federal agencies, local law enforcement, put, they put the word out through the media and then a guy finds him laying in a doorstep and they go in and effect an arrest and it seemed to be almost like a perfect coordination between local law enforcement and the federal agencies and that's got to be the way it's planned but for us watching that how does it go from bombs go off to we have a suspect to we've arrested a suspect so quickly how are you able to find that needle in a haystack so quickly well there's there's, there's several ways the the, the, the community the, the public has to participate and in this case it worked the media can be a big help if we get the pictures on in, in the uh, Boston uh, Marathon bombing, same yeah. thing. Once we identified two unknowns, boom, they put it right out and it wasn't long. But the other thing too is to understand the FBI as part of their JTTF and a part of their counterterrorism mission has a well-established now intelligence collection program and has agents that are have informants everywhere. They, they solely recruit informants for information. And so they immediately hit the network okay. with reaching out to their sources and saying, does this mean anything to you? Would, do, do you know anybody that was, was acting like this that might be responsible? And then they start accumulating intelligence there. And so, and the state and local police are doing the same thing. So you start putting all that intelligence into a bucket and start and putting pictures out and putting names out. Um, it can happen really fast because of the machine that's been built over the last 15 years. Now we're learning about this guy. I want to be, I'm going to play Monday morning quarterback with you and ask you the questions that everybody's asking now about how did this guy not get on the list. So we'll do that in a minute. We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, details about this suspect, but also about in Arizona, are we prepared for if something like that were to happen here? We'll be back. We are talking about terrorism in America with a professor of global security from Embry-Riddle. His name is Steve Hooper, and you were on the Joint Terrorism Task Force here in Arizona for a long, for how long? Well, I was uh, the agent in charge of it for uh, four years. Four years. So when you look at what this task force is doing, when you look at this case, the Monday morning quarterback in a lot of people is, how is this guy of all people not on a list? You know, all the trips to Pakistan and back to the Middle East, the, um, and some of the other things we're finding out, his father reporting him a couple of years ago and there was an investigation that was done. Um, what do you make of that? Is, that? is it too much, is it just too much of an easy thing to say he should have been on a list? Well, what you have to look at, especially in a place like uh, New Jersey, Newark, the Newark field office and the New York field office, you can imagine the number of potential or cases they're investigating that uh, it only takes one person to kind of bubble up on the radar. Um, so they try to manage every person that they get information on. Obviously, they had intelligence on this guy. And so uh, they took a look, and they open a preliminary investigation, and they go take it as far as they can. But short of committing criminal activity or being involved in criminal activity and, or committing a crime, it, it doesn't cross a line where they surge on it or put more resources on it. But one, another subject that they're looking at may, so they tend to focus on that. So it's a matter of prioritizing, and again, being New York and or Newark, there's probably a lot of uh, cases they're working, and they've got to prioritize them. He didn't rise to that level. Believe me, there's no one more uh, bothered by what happened than the agents and task force officers on those respective joint terrorism task forces after something like this happens because they were part of the investigation and couldn't, didn't, couldn't find stuff enough to get it to the point where they could take action to have prevented it. So that bothers them. So 
they just try to be a little different on the next one. Okay, he did these 10 things. Are any of our other subjects doing these 10 things? And they start looking at it. So they use it as a training tool. Absolutely. You got to do a lessons learned. So here in Arizona, we know that a couple of, um, couple of guys from Arizona went to Texas to try to commit that shooting there. So it's a busy place here in Arizona as well. How prepared is Arizona? And the people of Arizona, what should they be aware of? Phoenix PD did a training seminar with owners of bars in downtown Phoenix with their employees that if something were to happen, almost like a flight attendant if there's an issue on an airplane. And I thought it was one of the smartest things that I'd seen in a while. How prepared are we here for if something were to happen? The Joint Terrorism Task Force here is as robust and as active as, as any I've seen or been involved with. Um, there's a tripwire program that where we, ha we uh, focus on people who might, uh, and it could be, it's all the local businessmen, and people who see something that may be suspicious, so that if they see something that they think we should know about, they have a point of contact. It's not, who should I call on this? They have a direct uh, connection. So um, the, the, it's a very robust task force. I think, at last check, there's about 26 law enforcement agencies that are on the task force. Every East Valley PD, every West Valley PD, TSA folks, um, air marshals, all the other federal partners, all have people on the task force, um, which gives us access to information well beyond just the FBI's information. How many people on the task force in Phoenix? How many, how, uh, roughly, how many members are there? That's a tough question. Is there's uh, four squads plus a uh, intelligence squad plus analysts. Um, you're talking in excess of a hundred people, probably. And they're kept pretty busy. I mean, there's there's got to be a lot of information coming in and a lot of investigation that may not go anywhere, but you've got to follow all of them. No, no shortage of work. So moving forward with, with what happened here, it seems like this guy was mirroring a little bit of what happened in Boston, but a little bit more sophisticated in how he made these these um, these bombs. Does the investigation go in the direction of are there other people involved they should be looking at? Is, are they still investigating that as well? Oh, absolutely. So yeah. this network of, yeah. how long will it take to accumulate generally to get a good a digital footprint of you know his computer activity, his phone activity? Well, it, in, in again, you have to look at the areas. So you're in New, Newark and New York, uh, very populated, very busy. Um, a lot of activity. If any of his, elect, his digital activity leads overseas, there's a bit lengthy uh, part of the investigation that'll happen overseas. That, of course, will take even longer. Um, we'll have to uh, reach out to foreign governments and foreign entities and so forth. But in general, um, you know, it, there's really no way of saying how long it will take. It depends on what those, the digital evidence shows and additional evidence that indicate how big his network was. I appreciate the insight. We always like to find things out from people that have been there. So we appreciate your service for the years that you served and, and thank you for the insight on the show. Thank you, Mike. We'll be back. Welcome back. It's time for one of the best parts of the show. We call it From Arizona for America. It's our way to congratulate and thank the fine Arizona men and women who have recently graduated from boot camp and are now serving in our country's military. So if you would join me in honoring Airman Jesse Ferrari from La Jolla Community High School in Avondale, Airman Kendra James from McClintock High School in Tempe, and Airman Malachi Lawrence from Lake Havasu High School in Lake Havasu City. For a full list of more of our friends and neighbors that are from Arizona for America, you can go to the Mike Broomhead page at aztv.com. We'll be back in a minute with Broomhead's Best and hashtag this. A special Diamondbacks edition of something we call Broomhead's Best. Paul Goldschmidt of the Arizona Diamondbacks gets his 500th RBI. The only other Diamondback in history to do it is Luis Gonzalez. Two home runs in the win against the Padres and a three-game sweep. Congratulations, Paul Goldschmidt. You're this week's Broomhead's Best. 
Now what's burning up the internet? We call it hashtag this. All right, between two ferns is the hashtag. If you've not seen it with Zach Galifianakis, he had Hillary Clinton on, and it's on the website Funny or Die, which is owned by Will Ferrell. Absolutely hysterical. You can see in this video, he is so funny and she is not amused. Go check it out on Funny or Die. It's hashtag between two ferns. We're gonna be back here in just a moment to close out the show, so don't go away. Before we close out the show, I wanna remind you of something. The next time you think your vote doesn't count, Congressional District 5, Andy Biggs wins CD5 over Christine Jones. After all the recounts and the courtrooms and everything else, 86,000 votes were cast in the district. He won by 27 votes. 27 people could have made a difference if they had voted in that election. Don't ever believe your vote doesn't count. When they say it's the most important election of our lifetime, it really is. And four years from now, that one will be. Make sure you make sure your voice is heard. Be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. That is what we should do. We're out of time. I'll be back next week at Saturday at 6 and 10. Thanks for being here on the Mike Broomhead Show. Have a great week. God bless. Get more of Mike Broomhead on Facebook, Twitter, and of course weekday mornings from 6 to 10 on News Talk 550 KFYI.